Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Simon seminar on geometric methods and optimization and sampling. So next, we'll have Max Raginski at UIVC, who will give us a wonderful tutorial on uh, sampling using diffusions. So, Max. All right. Um, well, uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Asia, for the introduction. Thank you to the organizers for, uh, for inviting me for an opportunity to actually present this um, in person, because I love coming back here to the Simons Institute. Um, so my original plan was to give a talk about Langevin Monte Carlo, but after Andreas's masterful exposition that covered everything I would have talked about, I decided to change things a little bit and to tell you about a class of diffusion processes for exact sampling that has been um, part of my recent interests. And uh, the nice thing about this is that you will see the connections to stochastic calculus and PDEs. And there is an indirect connection to optimal transport as well that I'll mention towards the end. So it ties uh, together the topics of, um, of this uh, bootcamp, I think in, a, in, another, uh, in a rather organic way. Um, so a couple of kind of, logistical remarks. My eyesight is terrible. So if you raise your hand to ask a question, I won't see it. And so it's not like I'm ignoring you. It's like, I can't see it. So if you want to ask a question, just, just speak up. And uh, also, I guess I, I can't really keep my eyes on the clock. So I'm going to start this thing to buzz at 50 minutes in. Okay. And then I, I guess that that'll leave time for questions if I'm done before then. All right. So, um, all right, let's get into it. So, We've talked about um, the Langevin dynamics, right? So the idea was that uh, you want to sample from, from a distribution that has a density F with respect to the Lebesgue measure on RD, right? Um, some additional assumptions under F. I mean, typically it's assumed that uh, it's of the Gibbs form so it's e to the minus u, use some potential, you impose all sorts of um, restrictions on a potential, but the idea is that you do this by means of a diffusion process, right? This uh, Langevin diffusion process dxt, it's an Ito stochastic differential equation. Uh, and here we have grad log fxt. So you're doing gradient descent basically on negative log likelihood. Uh, and here you have the standard Brownian motion. So here time is starting at zero and um, you start with some nice probability law mu naught for, um, for the initial point. Zero. And then the idea is that under some conditions that you impose, you want uh, the convergence of along ut to the target asymptotically, right? As t goes to infinity. And then, of course, you, know, you might want to get rates for this thing, which is exactly where various functional inequalities come in, Poincare inequalities, logarithmic, Sobolev inequalities, et cetera. But the moral of the story here is that with the Langevin process, which is extremely simple to implement because here you, you only need to know F up to a mul multiplicative constant because any sort of a multiplicative constant is killed by the gradient. And this, uh, uh, and this is a stochastic differential equation with a time invariant drift, right? Uh, instead, I wanna talk about a different approach. So instead, I wanna talk about sampling now from a target mu that has a density F with respect to standard Gaussian on RD, right? So the standard Gaussian on RD, gamma is this traditional notation. It's the usual thing that we all know about, right? This is the standard Gaussian density, Gaussian measure on RD. And I would like to set up a diffusion process. Uh, Dxt. For now, I'm going to denote the drift 
of this by some generic B. This drift now will be time varying. Um, and we have the Gaussian noise, the Brownian motion. Here, we're going to impose two different restrictions. First of all, we're going to require that our time starts at zero and ends in, let's say, one hour, you know, your units of time. We start at the origin, the deterministic initial condition. And the goal is to guarantee that mu, your target, is exactly the law of this thing at t equals one. Right, obviously, this is an idealization because clearly, you know, the way I've set this up, you might be thinking about some sort of free lunch. There's no free lunch because once you have to discretize this thing, all sorts of nasty uh, limitations pop up. Um, discretization and Monte Carlo based on this is still a very active research area. So, you know, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of things to do and I'm sure, you know, some of the talks um, in the rest of bootcamp and the rest of this program might actually lead to some development in this. But this is our goal. So uh, the problem of starting with just a Brownian motion and adding a drift that depends on time, such that you start at the origin, but then at t equals one, you end up with a sample from a target distribution. This is known as the Schrodinger bridge problem. So, well, it's, it's a special case of a Schrodinger bridge problem, which, it, which is a bit more general than this. Uh, and it goes back to a couple of papers by Schrodinger, one of the found, uh, founders of quantum mechanics, where he was interested in um, certain problems really related to understanding quantum effects, uh, but also understanding something about laws of nature and their stochastic description. The basic formulation was something like this. Suppose you have um, a particle and this particle diffuses through space. Um, and your null hypothesis is this is standard diffusion, right? So its position at time t obeys um, the usual um, Gaussian sort of uh, law, right? So there's a Brownian motion process. And this is your null hypothesis. If your null hypothesis is true at t equals one, you should look and uh, you know, the distribution of this particle, of the position of this particle should be standard Gaussian. So now suppose you have n such particles, they all start in the corner of some, let's say large cube or something like that. And you let them go, you know, the usual thing, they diffuse, you look at the empirical distribution of these particles at t equals one, and it does not look Gaussian. So what's the minimal, most parsimonious explanation of this? Right, so how should we perturb the Gaussian, you know, the, the Brownian motion in order to account for this non-Gaussian distribution at equals one? Schrodinger didn't exactly phrase it this way, but uh, you know, through lots of subsequent works by you know mathematical physicists and probabilists, it was crystallized into that particular form, and and then it was realized that what was really going on is a formulation of an optimal transport problem, but in the, in the anthropic sense, as opposed to uh, Monos Kantorovich um, formulation where you have a metric. So the abstract formulation, so before I construct this SDE in real time, basically using you know, bits and pieces of stochastic calculus and some PDEs right in front of you, using a derivation that I think is, has at least some original bits, um, I'd like to, first formulate what you might call a static version of this problem. And then we'll see that from that, we'll, we'll be able to work our way backwards to the construction of this drift, which these days is also known as the Filmer drift, um, named after Hans Filmer, who wrote a lot of papers related uh, to this. Okay, so, so let's uh, set the stage for the static optimization problem. So we're gonna be working on this path space omega, and it's the space of continuous functions from the unit interval into RD. And um, we're gonna define P. So P is the Wiener measure. Basically fancy words for the law of the entire sample path 
of the standard Brownian motion starting at the origin at t equals zero. But um, here we're only talking about its segment from t equals zero to t equals one. Right, so um, we would like to instead generate, construct another probability measure on omega that has the following property. So, so the goal is the following. So, so let me, let me uh, define the set M mu as the following set. It's gonna be all probability measures on omega. And I'm not gonna spend my time wallowing in technicalities about how, you know, what the sigma algebra here would be, et cetera, you know, measure theoretic niceties that, you know, are easy to reconstruct. But there are two conditions. Um, so Q naught, which is the law at time zero, is the Dirac sitting at zero. And Q1 is mu, right? So this is the set of all possible distributions on this path space that start at the origin, just like the standard Brownian motion. And then you look at t equals one and you get a distribution mu. And the static formulation of the Schrodinger bridge problem is the following. I would like to construct a measure Q mu, if it exists, as a minimizer overall measure uh, over all measures in this set of the relative entropy or the KL divergence between Q and the Wiener measure. All right, so this is a there there are no diffusions here yet. We're just talking about basically sampling and function space. Right, we have, you, could, you can almost think about a prior or some sort of a default measure on the function space, which is the Wiener measure. And we know that uh, realizations of the Wiener process are continuous with probability one. You can actually construct versions that are continuous everywhere. Um, and so we'd like to find a measure with satisfying these conditions. So the same initial distribution as a standard Wiener measure, but you know, the distribution at t equals one is manifestly not Gaussian. Right, so this is our problem. Um, so first, even without formulating anything about diffusions, you can extract a whole lot of structural information just by exploiting the fact that you're minimizing the uh, relative entropy. So let's fix some uh, Q and MU and write down, um, this relative entropy. Okay, so there's this wonderful result about relative entropy called the chain rule. And by the chain rule, I can um, express this relative entropy as follows. So I'm gonna look at what happens at t equals one. So just the marginals at t equals one. Plus, so I'm gonna write this down first, and then I'm gonna introduce uh, the definitions. So there's gonna be an integral over RD um, with respect to Q1. So here X is uh, just an element of RD times the divergence between two measures, which I'm gonna be denoting by UX and PX. And what are they? So QX is basically the conditional law under Q uh, subject to the condition that um, X1 is equal to X, right? So, so, so this is uh, now a probability measure on this path space omega subject to being pinned at location X at T equals one, the same thing goes um, for P. Right? So this is defined analogously. And this measure is very well known. It's uh, this, this distribution is, is called the Brownian bridge pinned at X. So this is, uh, this is called the Brownian bridge. So, um, and from this, we can already extract 
something useful. Because you see, Q1 is mu. P1 is gamma, the standard Gaussian, right? So therefore, I can write my relative entropy the following way. So Px is P of dot given a Well, Px is the same thing, but P, you know, obviously the, the underlying measure is P. So this is the you know Wiener measure conditioned on being at the point X at, at time one. Yeah. Right. Um, so this is equal now to relative entropy between D, uh, relative entropy between mu and gamma, plus basically an integral with respect to uh, mu rather. Uh, Right, with respect to mu, dx, relative entropy between dx, dx, and divergences are non negative. So this term is non negative. And therefore, this is lower bounded by the divergence between just the terminal distributions. And of course, equality is achieved if and only if. Uh, these two measures have the same bridges, right? So almost everywhere. And that basically means that um, we know the structure of the minimizing measure, right? So, so therefore, this tells us the following remarkable fact. It tells us that uh, the density, the radon nicotin derivative of the minimizing measure with respect to the Wiener measure Evaluated at so W here is, is the entire path, right? Uh, from the unit interval into, into RD. This looks like this. It looks like F of W1. So F is the density of the target with respect to the Gaussian measure. So therefore, we see that if we want to get a sample from, from mu at t equals one, all we need to do is take realizations. Of the Brownian standard Brownian motion and reweight them. And the reweighting is given by this, right? So it's almost like an important sampling type situation. But of course, we all know that uh, reweighting like this is not pleasant. You actually want to have a generative mechanism. You don't want to operate on measures, you want to operate on realizations. So this mean, means that what Wood really would like is, is a, I, I'm going to call it a transport map, quote unquote, T from omega to, to omega, right? Such that basically um, for any function f on path space, and this is uh, with respect to q mu, this is basically the same thing as taking expectations with respect to st standard Wiener measure, but now composing f with this transport now. This is not, you know, when I say transport, it's like I'm literally tra transporting a path to another path in such a way that this holds, so this holds for all smooth functions on, on, you know, on this path space. And again, you can define it rigorously. I'm not gonna do it. But the point is that this is really, I mean, you know, if you look at modern machine learning, the idea here is to do something like implicit generative modeling, right? You, you, know, you want to have a mechanism that takes realizations of the Brownian motion, which you can think about as your sort of you know, basic randomness, maps them, transports them, in such a way that now you get a sample from your target measure. So a rich source of such transport maps on path space is in fact given by paths of SDEs. You right. were saying one more time in the box uh, where it says F of W, yes. is that the a subscript one? One, yes, because this F, remember this F um, is a density with respect to Gaussian. So F takes, a d-dimensional vector is an argument, and w one. So here, oh well, let's let's actually. So here, w really is a path, right? So this is an element of omega, right? So w one is the terminal point of that. Thank you. So in other words, the density. So in other words, these are measures on path space, but the density of the target measure uh, of this uh, uh, optimal measure, the Schrodinger bridge measure, with respect to the Wiener one, is given only. It only depends on the terminal point. And these are known as generalized Brownian bridge processes. So basically, you can sort of wave your hands and say that if you have a measure like this that has this rod on nicotine derivative with respect to Gaussian, it's quote unquote standard Brownian motion conditioned to have distribution mu at time one. 
And there's a beautiful paper by Fabrice Badouin about these things, for example. And he, he explicitly introduced the term conditional stochastic differential equation. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is now, I'm going to construct a map like this using essentially the Brownian motion as the driving noise in a stochastic differential equation, which means I'm gonna construct a drift. Um, so this is this derivation, like I said, I, I, I haven't seen it anywhere precisely in this form. I think some bits like this part, for example, with the chain rule, that's everywhere. You know, Filmer in his lecture notes that some floor definitely had this. But the part that then goes back uh, from, from this formulation to the construction of drift, I think is fairly new, or at least, you know, but it seems rather natural to me because it allows you to introduce all these ideas from stochastic calculus and PDEs without really much you know, effort. And so it, it, it becomes very natural. So let's do this thing, you right? So, I ask one more notational question? Oh, sure, yes. Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm on the same right page. Can you say capital F one more time? Capital um, F is here any, any, uh, any smooth real valued function on the linear space. Great. I mean, if you want to be cute about it, like, you know, you'd have to talk about my event calculus and whatnot. But I mean, heuristically, this is what that is. Okay, can you tell me again how you got what's in the box? This, yeah. Um, so you know that. So, so the two processes have the same conditionals given given uh, the terminal point, right? And then and then you just write down the factorization of the measure, and you see that the conditionals cancel away, and the only thing that's left is really the density between the terminal the density of the two terminal distributions, right? I mean, basically, the idea is that if I have if I have joint distribution uh, on two objects x and y, and it looks like this. U D Y A X D Y, and then Q like Q looks like this. U D Y K X D Y. Note that the conditional kernels are exactly the same. The Radon Nikodim derivative of this with respect to this is just the Radon Nikodim uh, Nikodim derivative of mu with respect to new. Right. Divide them, and you, you see this. Okay, so, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to construct an SDE that's gonna give me this, right? So at some point, you're gonna have to use some amount of foresight. And the amount of foresight I'm going to use is I'm gonna look for uh, SDEs of a very specific form. So I'm gonna make kind of a gradient, yes. Yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm just a bit, con you never use what's in the box to actually come with your your desired outcome, right? Because we could no. have stated we won this push forward map way before we actually came to that conclusion. That's right, yes, okay, yeah. Okay, so so right, so now now we're gonna get to the construction of push forward. So, so we're gonna make a gradient on sorts, right? So We're going to look for a process that look, that's going to look like this. It's going to be governed by an Ito SDE that's going to have a drift in a form of negative gradient. Starting at zero. E runs from zero to one. Right, and let Q the law of x so the entire path right remember x here is den uh, denoting the entire path and what i would uh one not t and what i would like to guarantee is that this thing has um so i want q to be q mu right so in other words what i would really want is dq by dp evaluated at you know the generic path to look like this and that's the goal but we have this drift. So, so this, so at this point, this is where we pull out some result from stochastic calculus. So if you look at the standard Brownian motion and this, these two processes differ by just a drift. And there's a fundamental result in stochastic calculus called the Gersana theorem that basically says that any two distributions on the path space that only differ by a change of drift is absolutely continuous with respect to each other. And you can actually write down the radom nikodim derivative explicitly. So, so the Gersonov theorem, and again, there are conditions for it to be valid, you know, such as the Novikov condition or, you know, the Benesch condition, but, you know, you can look it all up. Um, the drift in this case would look like this. 
uh, or rather the um, the rod on equilibrium derivative. It's going to involve a stochastic integral of the drift against the standard Brownian motion. So this is multidimensional Brownian motion. This is an inner product. And then we're going to have um, a term that's going to look like this. This is Euclidean norm. All right, so now what I would like to do is to choose V, show you that you can construct a V that will uh, basically just give me this. I want this to equal just f of w1. That means I have to eliminate all this stuff that depends on the entire path. Okay, so how do you do it? Um, basically, the idea is to eliminate first to eliminate the stochastic integral to, to express it as uh, just ordinary integration of a stochastic process with respect to time. And as far as I know, this trick um, is due to Václav Benef and Larry Shep in a number of papers. And you know, I, I, it's really been ex exploited by, by a number of people since then. Um, so what we're gonna do is the following. We're going to define, so let V of T be this uh, V function, right? So, so this drift is a gradient of a function, which I'm gonna assume is twice differentiable in X, once differentiable in T, and let V be a scalar valued process that takes the standard Wiener process and feeds it into this function. So why am I doing this? Is because now I can use Ito's rule So by Ito's rule, we know that V1 is equal to V0 um, well, let, let, me, let me write in differentiable form, uh, differential form first. So DVT is going to be the following thing. This is going to be so so this is the part of the um, Ito's rule that gives you the usual chain rule. So this is partial of uh, V with respect to T. Then we're going to have um, this thing. So this is going to be the Laplacian of V. That's why we need twice differentiability. And then third term is going to be the noise term, and that's going to be the gradient V. You know, and that's going to be you know driven by the by the Gaussian noise. So Ito's rule gives me this, um, and therefore I can integrate it from from t equals zero to t equals one. So if I integrate it, I get v one is equal to v zero plus an integral from zero to one of this whole thing. So now you see this is where you know this is where PDEs are going to going to appear. So we already have a function of two a space of a space variable and of a time variable. And the Laplacian makes an appearance. And I'm gonna, you know, write this all out in its full gory detail because I'll need all of this stuff. And then I have the stochastic integral. Okay, so now we stare at this. And like I said, this is just a really ingenious device where you see everything in this formula is just ordinary. Integration, except for this little term, but this little term, ah, oh, this marker is worthless. Except for this little term, and this little term is precisely up to a sign is a stochastic integral that I would like to eliminate here. Right? So therefore, I can write. So you see that then minus the stochastic integral. This is the Edo integral against the standard Brownian motion, right? This is equal to V0 minus V1 plus, I mean, that's one uh, bad thing about giving a board talk, you can't copy and paste. So now I have to copy this all by hand. Right, 
right? So we have this, and now we're going to substitute that into this radon nicotine derivative. So let me do that. I think uh, we all know where this is going to go. So the idea is that you know there are terms in here that depend only on the terminal time one, and then there's an integral that depends on the entire path. And the idea is to impose conditions on v that allow me to set that integral to zero. But all in all, I get that dq by dp is the following thing. So after I eliminate, if I substitute this formula for the stochastic integral into here, I'm just going to write the end result. The end result looks like this. So this is v of 0, 0 minus v of w1, 1 minus the integral from 0 to 1 of the following thing. So here we have the partial of v with respect to t. Here we have half the Laplacian of v. Looks like I'm going to have to move to the next line, but that's okay. Minus, right, because there was a plus sign here, minus half the squared norm of the gradient of V. Right, so basically now I have, you see, this is what's going on here. This depends only on W1. This depends on the entire path. So naturally, what I would like to do is to find V that'll accomplish two things. It'll set this integral to zero. And the, you know, a nice way is to just guarantee that this integrand is always zero. And then the remaining terms will give me f of w1. Right, so therefore, you know, this is where you get the PDE, right? So let's suppose that our v solves the following uh, Cauchy problem. v by dt, v now is just a function of x and t plus half the Laplacian is equal to half the squared norm of the gradient, right? So on the entire space and the unit interval, subject to the terminal condition, V of X comma one is some function. Uh, I'm gonna write it with, with a bit of foresight as, negative log psi of x. Here psi of x is some function that's strictly positive. Okay. So, I mean, there are PDE experts in this audience and I'm sure they recognize this thing right away. This is hamilton jacobi bellman equation. It's a PDE and it's nonlinear because of the squared norm is gradient. Thankfully, there's a wonderful trick going back again to theory of PDEs known as the cole hoff transformation or the logarithmic transform. And in the context of SDEs and control was used by Wendell Fleming. So the idea is the following. So let's do log transform. Let's define hx of t as e to the minus v x t. And then it turns out that this H solves a much nicer PDE. A H solves, this is an, like just really character building exercise in multivariate calculus, right? So we still have the Laplacian, but the right-hand side is zero on RD one. And the terminal condition now is H of X one is psi of X. Now, of course, we need to choose the psi of x, right? So this is actually like if you if you look at uh, you know your you know any good uh, textbook on, on on PDEs, you'll you'll see this. But Wendell Fleming was the one who really used it in the context of probabilistic systems and control to you know really great effect. Plus, also you know if you've heard of something called stochastic mechanics, this is Ed Nelson's attempt to kind of come up with a stochastic formulation of quantum mechanics. It, it's it's there as well. So this PDE, this we can actually solve. So this is remarkable that this, this PDE can be solved using another really basic result that, uh, that ties together theory of diffusion processes and uh, certain class of parabolic PDEs. And it's the feynman cotts formula.
And this is really a simple version of Feynman Cox formula. There's a much more complicated thing with a multiplicative potential, but you know, this is good enough for our purposes. Basically, the claim is this that this H of X and T is equal to a conditional expectation of the terminal condition psi at time one, given that the Brownian motion at time t was at point x, right? So this is on RG. Right, in particular, we see that h of zero, zero is simply the expected value with respect to standard Gaussian of psi of x. Right, so uh, I mean, we actually, I can easily prove the Feynman cost formula. I mean, at least one direction of it, that, that this, is, this is the representation. And the idea is once, once again, to use Ito's rule. So Ito's rule gives me the following. So basically it says that dH WTT is equal to this. This is the generator of the Brownian motion plus that H. And the wonderful thing is that this whole thing is zero by the PDE that this solves. And therefore we can write H of W1 comma one is equal to H of WT T plus MT and MT is a zero mean martingale. It's the stochastic integral here. So therefore now all I need to do is take the conditional expectations of both sides, conditioning on XT. So therefore, oh, or well, WT. So, so conditioning on this, Uh, X, not T, of course. Right, so the martingale has zero mean, and I'm only left with this. And of yeah, course, you can't see there, right? I'll, I'll step away. And of course, this thing is just psi of W1. So I gave you a very quick proof of Feynman Cotts formula in its simple version. Right, okay, so, so therefore, coming back to this, we see that this, uh, this, this has paid off, and what we're left with is the following. So putting everything together, we're left with the following um, thing. So, so DQ by DT of W is X of what? So this is V of zero, zero minus V of W one, one, because uh, the integral that was there and I erased went away because of this PDE, right? And so uh, now we write this as what? We write this as H of W one, one divided by H zero, zero, and by construction, this is psi of W1, that does not look up like psi, Let's make it better. divided by expected value of psi of W1. And now you see what, what you do, you just take psi, the yeah. f well here i mean this this you know here you need to assume the f is nowhere nowhere zero right so and now we see that in fact expectation value of psi with respect to w1 is simply one right because right because this is f and this is simply the, the fact that uh you know f is the rather nicotine derivative of mu with respect to standard gaussian and therefore you see that this is exactly f of w1 so now um that means that the drift that we were looking for, see, it actually does come off. It's a magnet. Uh, the drift that we were looking for has this form. So 
So V of X V is now negative log H V. Therefore, it's negative log of expected value. F one conditioned on WT being X. And therefore, our SDE looks like this. Now it's a negative gradient of that, right? So this is gradient with respect to the space variable of log this thing. And X, oh, here, of course, I should put in XT. And here are the expectations with respect to the Wiener measure. XT is non uh, is, is, is conditioned on that. Uh, X0 is 0. He runs from 0 to 1. And this already automatically guarantees that X1 will have law mu. And this is the optimal process. Right, and I mean, so so a, a nicer way of writing this uh, is to introduce the Euclidean Euclidean heat semi group. Um, I'm not going to do it, but uh, I mean, there's 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 a way to do it. But the point is that this is the Fulmer drift that you know appears in this problem of optimally perturbing the Brownian motion to give me a desired distribution at t equals one in such a way that the resulting measures on path space are as close as possible in the sense of relative entropy. Okay. Um, any questions? Yeah, so, so could you say again, under which conditions there's another theorem is valid? Does, what, does this require Gaussianity of any? Uh, no, um, Gaussianity of what? Oh no, okay, so here's, 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 here's the Gersana theorem in, uh, in, um, in the following uh, setting. So, so the idea is that, so dq by dp, so p here is a Wiener measure. So as long as there exists a process that's you know adapted to the filtration generated by the Brownian motion, and it looks like this. So process u, ut, dwt plus, Uh, no, there's no gradient because this is a general. So as long as this um, basically, so let's call this Z. So as long as this has expected value one under the um, under the Wiener measure, then you can show that. And now suppose you have a uh, you have uh, this um, x t so all right q it's plenty of time so I can actually explain this so here we assume that q is the law of x um, the idea is that if I now define the following process if I define a process called w u that looks like this it's x t minus x zero minus this integral of the drift, us ds. This has Brownian, this is a Brownian motion on the Q. In other words, what happens here, X has some distribution Q. If I subtract the drift, the resulting object is a Brownian motion. So the idea is that, you know, any two probability measures on this linear space that are absolutely continuous with respect to another one, one another differ only by a change of drift. And you can actually write down this uh, rather negative derivative explicitly, the conditions really to guarantee that you have this. Like this is what you, as long as you can prove that this is the case in Europe. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this, yes. Um, well, the only, right, so, 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 I mean, the only basic assumption um, is this F is, let's say, um, everywhere positive. And um, 
I mean, you, you, you could usually assume you know, it's bounded, so, so that, and its gradient is bounded, right? So Lipschitz, so, so that way you can guarantee existence of a strong solution, right? Because I mean, uh, w under weaker condition, you can, you know, you, you can show this as D has a weak solution, which basically means you can construct some other probability space on which all this is going to be true, as opposed to saying X D is basically a functional of the Brownian path up to time T, which is the notion of the strong solution. It's precisely that transport map T. That encapsulates the fact that you know we're building a you know strong solution, so there has to be a like progressive measurability and related assumptions. But uh, yeah, I mean the, the assumptions on F are, like I said, fairly minimal. Yeah. Just make sure to understand. So that expectation there, it's really just over a single. Uh, sorry, to the right. No, 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 where you find yeah. yeah. Here. Yeah, that's really just expectation over a single scalar Gaussian, actually. No, it's conditional, right? Because I mean, this is, so so here the idea is that you're looking at the conditional distribution of the of the Brownian motion at time time one given time t, and those have an explicit form, right? I mean, it's just Gaussian. What? So 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 the conditional. So okay, well, let's actually write this out. So let's define the following thing. Uh, k t of some function f. Is defined as expected value of f x plus root t z, where z is a standard Gaussian. Then um, the former drift here, so negative. So, so then the idea here is that this uh, v that we have, v of x t, that drift over here is negative log a1 minus t f. Right. So, so it's the expectation which involves only single scalar Gaussian. No. P is the Wiener measure. So the, right. but once you're conditioning it, as you wrote it there, right? The KT, that expectation inside the KT is just a single. I mean, this, this boils down. What am I missing here? Is it, is it's Gaussian with okay. It's a multivariate Gaussian. Right? It's a multivariate Gaussian with a mean at x t and variance one one minus t. No, but why multivariate? It's just oh, because it's okay. Sorry, 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 sorry. But okay, multivariate, but it's not a process, right? Because it's uh, it's a vector. So you're because you're no, no, no. I mean these. So so the the, the distribution. I, I already wrote it down. This is the conditional distribution. I mean, you, okay, you can say it's a multivariate Gaussian whose variance is one over t time one minus t times identity. But but the point is the reason why I wrote it this way is because we obtained this expression through the transition functions of transition probability functions of the standard Brownian motion. Sure, sure. But once you condition it's, it's once you condition it's really yes. I mean it's be, I mean if it, because it's obvious, right? This, this is this you, you can just explicitly write this out. In fact, this is uh, you know like if you've seen this uh, whole what Nestor of Spakoini you know randomization approach. Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure. I yeah. Know. Okay. And the same is this the so this is the unique argument, but is this the, the only way to get if I actually want to get the solve the drift problem? Is no, it's not no, no, it's not the only way. I mean, I, like I said, I like this way because it's natural because you go, you have two expressions for the for the density that you want. No, One didn't, of you didn't mean the only way to write it. I mean, is this the only uh, drift that will get me to solve the drift problem? Yes. So we see that? Um Yes, there is a way to see that. So the idea is to consider all possible uh, drifts that just somehow result in mu at equals one. And uh, and it's basically just a data processing argument. You, you see right away that, uh, that, that the relative entropy, so you know, for any drift, it's just a relative entropy between the, you know, the corresponding path space measure and the Wiener measure. Once again, you use a chain rule and you see that you can always decrease it. By you know having these two uh, having having you know the, this candidate measure and the Brownian uh, uh, you know the Wiener measure have the same bridges, same same argument using chain rule. So, but that again, this is about the, the minimum uh, tail. Yeah, no, but okay. So let me strictly on the strict convexity of the KL. So it tells you there's no, a unique uh, measure on path space and, and, no, and so the next step is the KL IP. But if you don't care for the KL, I just want to solve this. Oh, I mean, right. If you're not minimizing the KL, there are lots of choices. It's <laughs> obviously right. Yeah. No, the minimizer of the KL is unique. Um, and and now I want to uh, revisit this this nonlinear PDE that that um, that 
that we uh, kind of solved using you know it's kind of um, I actually you know, have one minute left, so you know there's plenty of time, right? So so remember, so this V, I mean one minute left, 50 minutes, so 10 more minutes after that. So V, remember that you know what, what was happening is this V had to solve this Hamilton Jacoby Bellman. It's called Hamilton Jacoby Bellman because you know, like if you're trained in uh PDEs, you'll recognize it, but you know, to a, to a control theorist, this just raises all sorts of flags and, and you know what to do next. So, so it looks like this. So Hamilton, Jacobi, Belden. By dt of vxt plus half to Laplacian. V is equal to one half. Right? So x and t are r one and uh, the, the condition was that uh, v of x one was negative log f of x. So again, you know, if you see the word Hamilton, Jacobi, Palmer, like okay, there has to be a, an optimal control problem there somewhere, and in fact there is. The optimal control problem hides in the following way, and this is one of those things where you see certain quantities, and you just Recognize it. This is the minimum for all vectors in RD of, of this in a product of U the gradient V plus one half squared norm of U. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to consider a controlled V. So um, basically, you're going to do something like this. Dx u t u here is an adapted drift process. So adapted means that u t is measurable with respect to the you know the the segment of the Brownian path up to time t, but this is u t d t w t, and uh, u. The, the superscript u is meant to indicate that, in fact, you know the, the choice of the drift then determines the path. So we start at zero, t runs from zero to one, and we define for each such drift the following objective: the j of u is expected value of one half the integral from zero to one of the squared norm of u t minus log f okay so what do we see the idea is that we would like to add a control to a standard brownian motion the control comes in the form of a drift and each control comes with a cost the cost penalizes the total effort right this is the you know control energy throughout the entire path and then there's a terminal cost that basically says okay start at zero choose a drift and wherever you end up at time time one we're going to penalize you by minus log f. So you know, so so this is a terminal cost. This is a running cost. And now you see that this is the Hamilton Jacobi Bellman for the value function, if you know what that is, for for this control problem, right? So therefore, we see that the former drift is such that it is the control that minimizes the sum. And moreover, you can actually see that the minimum value of this. Overall admissible drifts. That also has to satisfy, you know, drifts have to be square integrable like this. This is equal to zero and achieved by the former drift. And from this, you see right away. So you see, so this, uh, so, so, so therefore, so let's call this J star equal to zero because j star is equal to zero but j star is equal to two things so by Gersonov theorem the first term is simply the kl divergence between q mu and p and the second term is actually negative kl divergence between mu and gamma and these two things are equal and therefore you see that with the former drift 
the you know this is precisely that fact that the the the, the density of q mu with respect to p only depends on the terminal point therefore it's a generalized brownian bridge and you can immediately see simply by data processing inequality that for any other u that gives you mu at t equals one this scale that th th this cost is greater than or equal to zero therefore scale divert so so okay so so for any u such that x u one has long u j of u is equal to KL divergence between this uh, Q. So Q is well, QU of XU and P minus this terminal cost is always the same because we assume that you know we get mu at time equal, uh, greater, than, greater than zero. It's, this is greater than or equal to zero. And therefore, any other drift is going to give you a value that's um, that's that's the, the gale divergence here is going to introduce some waste. The former drift is sort of the most parsimonious. It really uses up the drift in the, in the most economical way, meaning that all of the drift goes into making basically just equalizing these two terms. And obviously, these two terms are, you know, like this is greater than or equal to zero simply by data processing, but uh, for KL divergence, but you also see that this comes out of the control formulation. Okay, so uh, yes. I got a bit lost. Why did you write uh, that the square norm of the gradient was this minimum? I mean, did you use it somewhere? Or I think yes. So, so, so the idea is the following. Um, okay. So I can tell you. Sorry. I mean, I I assume too much. Um, so the idea is the following. So. So consider the following control this d. So same thing, control this d is d x u t is u t d t plus d w t. And let's suppose you start x u zero and zero. Let's say t is between zero and one. And what you would like to do is minimize the j of u now is going to be the following thing. It's going to be expected value. Of some running cost, so there's going to be some some cost function c of the position of this particle and the control, and then it's going to be a terminal cost. Let's call this terminal cost g of x u one. And you'd like to find so, and you'd like to minimize this thing overall use. And it turns out that the optimal. So what what happens then? You have to set up. PD that comes from dynamic uh, dynamic programming principle. So this is just the part of the dynamics that comes from the fact that if you don't add a drift, you have the, just a standard Brownian motion. And here you have to have minus minimum. Now these U's are vectors. And here you have to have U in a product with gradient V X T. This comes from the fact that simply applying Ito's rule for a fixed for a fixed uh, uh, vector u, consider a SD with this generator. So the generator of that is um, this plus that. And here you're going to have the control cost, C, X, and U. And if you find such a, and, and then the terminal condition for this thing, DX1, has to be your terminal cost. So then if you find such a function, there's a result called the verification theorem that basically has said, so then the, the optimal control is of the Markov form. It only depends on the current state X and it's basically negative gradient of this DXT. So, so that's why what I did there is you see, I recognize this, uh, you know, and this is, this was like, again, sort of, you know, Wendell Fleming's uh, uh, brilliant insight that this thing just from Legendre Fenchel duality is the minimum of this. And once you write it in this way, you see you're minimizing over controls, this becomes an optimal control problem that you can solve, right? So, so uh, there's a nice book by uh, Fleming and Richel on deterministic and stochastic optimal control. It really goes into detail on this. I mean, and this sort of thing, like you stare at some nonlinear function and you recognize it as an extremum is a rare skill. I mean, the only other instance when, there was, when, when this was deployed to just, you know, dazzling, uh, effect is uh, this paper by Ramon Van Handel on the Borel Earhart game when um, 
There was a PDE that appeared uh, in a work by Krister uh, 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 Borel on, uh, on, on, on this air hardening inequality, which is a fundamental inequality for Gaussian, for Gaussian measures. And Ramon recognized that this non, certain nonlinear exp expression is actually a min max. And once you have a min max, instead of a control problem, you have a gain. You know, again, described by SDEs, and then you can uh, do all sorts of stuff. Just once you extract this game, you, you can prove, you know, both lower and, and upper bounds just using, you know, interchanges of min and max. So this, you know, this idea of being able to recognize that this term, which, you know, brings a nonlinearity here, like one way to eliminate it is to do this, this logarithmic transformation that gives you a linear PDE and you know how to solve it. But the other one is, is recognizing that this is a, uh, a minimum of this, you know, additional Hamiltonian term, Hamiltonian in the sense of Pontryagin maximum principle, not, you know, necessarily Hamiltonian dynamics. Anyway, um, that's all I have to say. So thanks for listening and, uh, and thanks for the great questions. I'm sure there are probably more. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful uh, exposition. So if there are any questions. Yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. So what happens if, I mean, if in the original optimization problem, if you solve the Q and the P, so here you, you fix the P on the second coordinate of the KL, but I mean, you know, if you, if you swap them, the, uh, how does the story go with that? Case? Um. <laughs> I mean, that's a very natural formulation. Obviously, you know, I, I haven't tried it, but you know, I think the technology that I presented, you could try and see whether it, it you know, leads to anything sensible. Um, right, so, you know, once again, you'd be able, because, you know, the, the, the two diffusion processes uh, whose, you know, path space laws are absolutely continuous, or, or, you know, two diffusion, okay, let's put it this way, two diffusion processes that differ by change of drift, their laws are mutually absolutely continuous. And you can write a rod on the negative derivative of, you know, any one of them with respect to the other with an explicit formula. And then you like probably play the same game and, and stuff like that, right? But, but the only thing of course, is that uh, it's, um, it's relatively straightforward about what to do with you know, the reweighting of the Wiener measure. But once you know, you're trying to write it the other way, I mean, you have to look at the actual marginal of your Q process, right? And you don't know what that is ahead of time. And then you have to get, Guarantee that you know, you go the other way. I mean, there, there, so there there probably is a, a version of the Schrodinger bridge problem where the two distributions are reversed in the in the KLA versions. But uh, I mean, honestly, I, I haven't I haven't really tried uh, working that out. Does this does this help the Jacobi Feldman formulation to yield uh, any algorithm? Uh, for I mean, in principle, yes, because there there are numerical methods for for optimal control. I mean, there there you know there, there are whole books written on time discretization of HJB equations. So basically, the idea is that you know one easiest thing would be to discretize time and space and solve a dynamic programming problem for a Markov decision process in discrete time. Uh, and then you know, you keep track of the discretization error. So you can use different oracles, though, right? You can use different oracles. Right. So someone is that, and is it? If I want to, uh, if I care about the, how fine I have to discretize, is that related to? So, so here we looked at the drift that minimizes either the KL from the Weiner or this uh, energy, the you know, integral of, right. of energy. Is that somehow related to how fine you have to discretize or discretization there? Um, that's it. Be that it's different, but actually here be easier to discretize. Always, you know, also a different drift would have, you know, could have other advantages. It would be easier to discretize. Um, the other, the other, you know, troubling effect that this is an optimal control problem in finite time. And optimal control problems, unlike gradient descent, which just does its thing, it's completely myopic, right? That like I'm going against the negative gradient right now. Optimal control problems have this kind of a, you know, final cause, right? Like basically, the, the terminal condition influences what happens early on. In particular, the value of the Fulmer drift is at zero. You need to know the mean of the target, right? So that's a problem because if you only know the target distribution up to a constant, then that kind of you know that, that advantage goes away. So that means that you could construct suboptimal drifts that you know are easier to the corresponding SD is easier to discretize. You could you could then account for basically it's almost like a thermodynamic argument, right? The control is doing some work. 
And former drip does the minimum amount of work. And you could characterize, okay, if I'm willing to do extra work on top of Fulmer, you know, I could probably extract some additional advantages from this. Yes. So uh, with, with, with J that you had uh, previously, right, exactly the place you had this, right, you had basically the kinetic energy plus the entropy. Could you yes. talk maybe for a minute or two with, with, uh, about connections with the entropy regularized optimal transport? Okay, the connection to entropy regularized optimal transport is, is somewhat subtle because uh, that, so what I introduced here is called the Schrodinger half bridge. So the idea is that you start at um, a deterministic initial condition, zero could have been anything else, but you start at zero. Um, now, suppose you start at a random initial condition, right? So, if you start at a random initial condition, right? So, so basically the idea is you have dxt against some drift dxt t dt plus dwt. And suppose x zero has law mu zero. And you want to design a drift in such a way that x one has law mu one that has a density with respect to a Gaussian. And at the same time, you minimize the KL divergence between the law of X, that's Q, and uh, P mu zero. And P mu zero is the Wiener, is the Wiener uh, measure, but you know, now the initial distribution, the initial position has distribution mu naught. This requires uh, setting up a forward backward system, um, which is, uh, if you discretize it, you get the Sinkhorn iteration, which is basically entropic optimal transport in discrete time. But you can come up with a continuous time version. The idea is, so before I wrote chain rule only looking at thermal distribution. Now I'm going to look at all possible couplings of mu and uh, mu naught and mu one. And you know, just so so I'm going to write down the joint distribution of x zero and x one, and then condition the rest of the process on the initial point and terminal point. That's a full bridge. So once again, you see that you know the optimal distribution should have the same bridges as the Brownian motion. And now you're looking for basically the uh, minimum KL divergence between, you know, mi minimum coupling of mu naught and mu one and KL divergence. So that's the relation to entropic op full entropic optimal transport. There's another wonderful result that you can put an epsilon in front of the Brownian motion and, and consider these problems. Now, of course, you're comparing everything to like, uh, a Gaussian with you know rescaled variance, and then in a certain way, if you scale things just right, as epsilon goes to zero, you recover the you know the optimal uh, monsch kantorovich l two Wasserstein problem. That's a result by uh, Tercio Mikami. So so this idea that is that in a certain low noise limit, entropic optimal transport becomes just ordinary monsch kantorovich optimal transport. This is slightly different. Here the idea is that the transport map, quote unquote, it's not it's optimal in in, in a different sense. The idea is that you take your Wiener measure, your Brownian motion, basic Brownian motion is kind of this free resource and you apply a function to it that maps paths to paths. And you can think about it as kind of a generator in you know, these uh, you know, implicit generative models. And the idea is that you minimize the KL divergence, you perturb the, you know, your random resource as little as possible, but this is not the same thing as, as an optimal transport because clearly you're coupling the Dirac sitting at zero to like to mu, but this, but this is not really like you're not minimizing cost other than like this this tail divergence between the two path state measures. So the full Schrodinger bridge problem that does give you entropic optimal transport and, and like I said, the low noise limit gives you the, just the usual L2 Wasserstein. And you can actually recover. So you know from that part, you can write down the, the optimal control formulation, take this uh, you know noise variance to zero, you end up with the you know Benamou Brenier formulation for, for the optimal transport. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Oh, um, yeah, could you give some like intuition on the flavor of a uh, sampling problem where this sort of like possible control style of discretization is uh, is more favorable in terms of like like you know, algorithms? Um, like, more direct. Um, let, so right. Now. right. Uh, the, the motivations I know that make sense to me. I mean, the, the, in, in in the context of machine learning, I guess, or, or optimization, this is relatively new. The earlier problems came from physicists who wanted to look at things like 
individual biomolecules like RNA, DNA, proteins, blah, blah, blah. And they, you know, th these things are swimming in, in, you know, in, in solution in a cell in the presence of Brownian motion. And the idea was you want to construct these nanomachines that somehow induce various distributions in finite time as opposed to waiting for this thing to equilibrate. So, so physicists actually implemented some of these things in the lab. Uh, obviously, you know, probably not the same complexity problems as like neural net or anything like that. But you know, the, the idea was to induce uh, an exact distribution at a finite time, as opposed to waiting, you know, for this thing to relax sufficiently closely to the desired distribution. And uh, and then of course, you know, and then one can, as I said, fall back on fairly extensive. Uh, literature on um, numerical methods for optimal control problems to, uh, to construct approximate algorithms. But of course, you know, what's left to do for sort of our communities is to come up with fine quantitative bounds on all of this, because you know, th there, aren't that very, there aren't very many. Sorry, I guess, I guess more specifically my question was like, oh, oh thanks for the answer. Uh, like what about the structure of the problem makes one, uh, would, would one be led to believe that this sort of, this sort of iteration um, has faster convergence than like waiting for like some. Uh, well, I mean, I I can cook up f in such a way that it's log sobel of con like its relaxation time is much larger than one, right? So you'd have to wait much longer than you know one one time unit. Like oh yeah. Oh, well, again, discretization is is wide open territory. Like uh, you know, it's um, because you know, if you discretize uh, just the usual Langevin dynamics, you have to worry about you know you maybe metropolizing it to get unbiased densities and all sorts of stuff like that. So you know, once you take all of that stuff into account, uh, you know, it becomes kind of complicated. So I mean, you have to make sure you're comparing oranges to oranges in a sense, right? Yeah, very little is known about uh, you know numerics of uh, of Schrodinger bridges. It, 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 I'm sure the answer is like probably right on the board, mind you. But um, I, so if the no, low noise limit to this is the gives you the fact that it's kind of frame, why can't you use that? Uh, and that seems like there there has there would have to be some question taking going on if you just said, oh, you know, we can sample from the terminal measure by just having an oracle that gives you the optimal you know pressure field that just sends the measure to the but but right but so why does this work <laughs> what i mean it it works in the same way as the the venom Bernier system works right and like you you actually have to find the optimal transport map i right? have to solve the mange ampere equation all this other stuff it's not like there's free lunch you know you know that you that get uh like i said the motivation here is really you know kind of the physics of the problem and relative entropy actually has phys you know physical meaning like i said in in, in this uh uh, theory of, uh, you know, nanosystems, uh, you know, you, you connect this to actually physical thermodynamic entropy. And that's the resource that, you know, you would like to, uh, you'd like to dissipate as little heat as possible into, into the environment, of, you know, for, for example. And plus, you know, of course, we know from the work of, uh, you know, Marco Caturi and others that, you know, somehow just computationally finding, uh, you know, transport plans for, uh, for, for entropy is, is easier than, uh, than the Monge problem. All right, thanks. Thank you.